Nochmal herzlich willkommen an alle zu unserem Webinar from Asset Management to Asset Intelligence, das wir zusammen mit Axonius durchführen. Mein Name ist Richard Hellmeier. Ich bin hier der Geschäftsführer der Firma Aquayo. Wir sind der Distributor von Axonius und ich habe hier den Christoph Kumper und den David Bradley als Kollegen von der Firma Axonius, die das Webinar starten und da äh, würde ich auch dann äh, gleich an den äh, Christoph übergeben und würde ihm sagen, sagen lassen, ja, wer Axonius so ist. Vielen Dank. Ja, danke Richard und einen schönen Nachmittag an alle äh, Teilnehmer unseres Webinars heute. Äh, ähm, ich folge der Einleitung und stelle mich ganz kurz vor. Mein Name ist Christoph Kumper. Ich bin hier äh, bei Axonius für die Geschäfte in Deutschland verantwortlich und ähm, macht es seit ein paar Monaten. Das Thema von Axonius ist Cyber Asset Management oder Cyber Asset Attack Surface Management, so wie es Gartner nennt. Die werden immer komplizierter, diese Akronyme. In diesem Fall hat Gartner dieses, diese Kategorie extra gemacht, um Firmen wie Axonius den Raum zu geben, sich von dem Thema Asset Management, wie man es aus den letzten 20 Jahren her kennt, abzugrenzen. Es geht hier nicht alleine nur darum, zu wissen, welche Geräte habe ich und vielleicht auch noch, welche Software darauf läuft, sondern es geht im Wesentlichen darum, einen, einen einheitlichen, genauen und vertrauenswürdigen Überblick zu bekommen über alle Gerätschaften, über alle Benutzer, über alle Identitäten, über alle SaaS-Applikationen, über jedes Stück Software, das bei mir in der Infrastruktur genutzt wird. Das ist eine ganze Menge, die ich jetzt in einen Satz reingepackt habe. Das ist im Wesentlichen alles, was ich benutze, um meine IT damit zu machen und darauf mein Business aufzusetzen. Jetzt haben wir ja in der IT immer gerne ähm, Strategien und Policies und Projekte, um die Dinge noch besser, noch sicherer zu machen. Und wir stolpern sehr oft darüber, dass wir gar nicht überprüfen können, ob unsere Policies, ob unsere Vorgaben überhaupt erfüllt sind. Ich mache ein ganz einfaches Beispiel. Ich möchte gerne jedes Gerät mit einem Antivirus ausstatten. Ich kann aber gar nicht überprüfen, ob es überall drauf ist oder ob es irgendwo Geräte gibt in meiner Infrastruktur, die das vielleicht gar nicht haben. Das ist jetzt schon ein Einstieg in das ganze Thema. Heute werden wir uns mit dem Thema CMDBs beschäftigen und was man beim CMDB betreiben so alles für Schwierigkeiten hat. Und warum diese Schwierigkeiten eben aus genau den gerade äh, genannten Gründen durchaus relevant sind, warum man eben etwas, etwas mehr braucht als nur eine standardmäßig gut, gut geführte CMDB. Und wir werden dann überführen, warum das notwendig ist und wir werden dann auch äh, darauf eingehen, äh, wie wir so ein Thema mit Axonius angehen können und warum das von Vorteil ist und für wen das auch von Vorteil ist. Ich mag noch zwei, drei Worte zur Firma Axonius sagen. Die Firma wurde 2017 gegründet. Das ist eine israelische Company von zwei Leuten, die schon eine ganz gute Karriere zum Thema Cybersecurity hatten und zu diesem Zeitpunkt als freie Consultants unterwegs waren bei einem größeren amerikanischen Finanzunternehmen. Dort wurde ein Honeypot installiert und tatsächlich hat sich dann auch jemand für diesen Honeypot interessiert. Und die beiden Kollegen waren also ganz begeistert und gesagt, wir haben jetzt hier jemanden gefunden. Was ist denn das für ein Asset? Wir haben eine IP-Adresse. Wer besitzt denn das Asset? Wer hat denn hier die Hoheit? Wo steht das? Was wissen wir da noch darüber? Und dann meinten die Kollegen aus dem Security-Betrieb und aus dem IT-Betrieb dieser, dieser Finanzinstitution, ja, da müssen wir jetzt mal den Ticketing-Prozess fragen, den externen Betreiber fragen. Das kann dann schon mal zwölf Tage dauern oder vielleicht auch nur zwölf Stunden dauern. Und dann hat Axonius, oder dann haben die beiden Kollegen gesagt, das muss man anders in den Griff bekommen. Und es war die Idee, die Firma zu gründen. Es geht im Wesentlichen darum, dass wenn so eine Frage ansteht, man die Antwort in zwölf Sekunden bekommen kann und nicht in zwölf Minuten oder in zwölf Stunden. Die zwölf habe ich jetzt aufgemacht, es könnten auch drei sein. Aber es geht darum, dass man solche Fragen exakt genau dann beantworten kann, wenn sie aufkommen und nicht erst irgendwelche Unklarheiten im Prozess klären muss und von Hand nachsehen muss, wer ist da mit wem verbunden und welche virtuelle Maschine verbirgt sich dann hinter welchem Stück Hardware und derlei Dinge mehr. Nach der langen Vorrede zur, zur Firma Axonius vielleicht noch ein, zwei Worte. Wir haben hunderte von Kunden, 
Wir haben eine Unternehmensbewertung von 2,6 Milliarden Dollar. Wir wissen alle, dass solche Bewertungen durchaus ein bisschen Aussagekraft haben. Was aber viel spannender ist, ist die Anzahl der Kunden und auch der, der Umsatz, der allerdings nicht ähm, öffentlich verfügbar gemacht wird. Aber wir sind ja auf einem ganz guten Weg. Wir sehen uns als Marktführer in diesem Umfeld an. Das wird auch gerne mal Cyberhygiene genannt. Das wird gerne mal Assethygiene genannt. Aber ich habe es versucht, ähm, in der Einleitung schon ein bisschen aufs Gleis zu setzen. Es geht im Wesentlichen darum, dass ich exakt und ganz genau weiß, was benutze ich, um dann darauf basierend bessere und effektivere Entscheidungen zum Betrieb zu treffen. Ähm, wir haben heute eine Präsentation für Sie mitgebracht. Die wird mein Kollege, der David Bradley, gleich halten. Der David ähm, kommt aus dem schönen Irland und ähm, wird die Präsentation auf Englisch äh, halten. Das ist hoffentlich kein allzu großes Thema. Wenn es allerdings Fragen zwischendrin gibt, irgendwas wurde nicht verstanden oder irgendein Thema möge etwas genauer erläutert werden, dann bitte schreiben Sie es in den Chat. Wir haben ein genaues Auge auf den Chat, der ist hier bei mir auf dem Bildschirm. Die Kollegen von Arcaio werden auch mit drauf schauen. Wir werden die eine oder andere Frage vielleicht gleich mit einpflegen und einflechten, wenn es in den Verlauf der Präsentation passt. Ansonsten sehr gerne im Nachgang beantworten. Das ganze Webinar soll eine Stunde dauern. Die ersten zehn Minuten sind schon rum. Die Präsentation selbst sind vielleicht so 20 Minuten. Dann kommt eine Demonstration und da darf man dann auch gerne schon interaktiv werden. Das war es von mir. Ich äh, mag jetzt vielleicht noch mal dem Richard die Möglichkeit geben, noch andere Leute von Arcaio vorzustellen. Oder Richard, du kannst gleich weiterreichen an den, an den David. Ja, äh, ich wollte nur zwei Sachen sagen. Also wie gesagt, äh, wie du schon gesagt hast, die Fragen bitte in den Chat. Zum einen. Zum zweiten werden wir nach äh, ein paar Slides mal ein paar Fragen stellen, die Sie online bitte beantworten, damit das Ganze auch ein bisschen interaktiver ist. Und jetzt übergebe ich schon an den David. It's your turn. Ah, okay. So cool. Um, nice, to, uh, nice to speak to you all. Um, my name is David Bradley and I'm an S. Um, I'm a sales engineer here in, in Exonius. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk you uh, through the topic today. Um, the topic really is about moving from asset management to asset intelligence. And asset intelligence is really what we're, you know, we're calling the modern take on asset management, um, given the change of environments and landscapes over the years and, and the questions we now need to ask. Okay. And that's kind of what we're going to be going through um, today. So <clears throat> we always kind of start with a, with a, with a tweet when we're talking about this, because we think it can, um, we think it can sum up the challenge pretty, pretty simply, right? Um, there's obviously a bunch of challenges that we face when it comes to asset management. But when we think of something as simple as, you know, just a manager or a CISO walking into a room and asking a relatively easy question, how many Windows hosts do we have? Or how many of a certain device type? Or, or overall, how many assets do we have in our organization? Something like that. But something simple like the Windows host question here, and depending on who answers the question or what team answers the question, you get a a whole different plethora of answers, right? You have a whole different range of answers. And it's they, it's all their team's truth, right? They're, they're, they're seeing it from their vantage point. So that's a challenge, right? Um, and it's something that everyone can pretty much relate to uh, when you're talking uh, you know, to CISOs and you're talking to, to SOC teams and things like that as well. So why does the challenge exist in the first place, right? So the challenge exists in the first place if we think about the evolution of technology, right? Way back, way back when, probably in the 90s or so, it was all relatively straightforward. You had physical devices um, and hardware on very flat networks behind a firewall, maybe some antivirus and things like that. It was easy to manage. It was easy to, to gain visibility, easy to protect. Um, and everything was relatively straightforward, and, you know, retrospectively looking back. And then, of course, you know, as we moved in, as we moved on in the years, we moved into this virtualization world, right, um, where we started introducing Linux and Mac um, into enterprise and, and VMware, Hyper-V and all things uh, virtual. But that inherently then brought its own um, suite of management tools, suite of security tools, uh, different, uh, different operational tasks and layers to our network. We now have multiple layers in our network. It's not just these flat networks anymore. 
And then, of course, you start bringing in, you know, mobile devices. Uh, everyone was using mobile devices, and that all house sensitive data, customer data, et cetera. So data had to be managed, maintained, and secured as well. And this is yet another asset type. And then I suppose in the more recent years, but albeit still probably, uh, you know, more than a decade old at this stage, um, a lot of enterprise using cloud first strategies and, and have some sort of hybrid approach to um, their organization where they use, you know, on-prem and cloud or, or even poly cloud as it's called, uh, where you have multiple different cloud vendors in one organization. And when we think of assets and devices in the cloud, we start to think of things like, you know, workloads, Lambda functions, you know, S3 buckets, all these type of things um, that we would class as an asset. And they bring their own risk. So again, we need a whole new bunch of tools and a whole new bunch of management tools to maintain those and protect those. Um, so you can see where this is going, very siloed data and different asset types. And we haven't even spoken about like, OT environments, you think of manufacturing plants, you know, and any factory based thing, they have a lot of OT um, equipment, which is a whole brand new idea of asset. If you think of traditional IT, right, and um, new protocols and, and, and things that normal, uh, we'll say traditional IT folk have no exposure to. Um, so they are a whole uh, different asset type. And then we think of IoT, right? To layer that up again, IoT, every every uh, household, every workplace, every enterprise has some footprint of IoT systems from IP cameras to front door sensors and everything in between. Um, and what risk does that bring in, okay? So this these are all things we need to think about. So it makes the, it makes the whole, um, it makes the whole challenge very difficult. Um, so before moving on, what we're going to do um, throughout this presentation, I probably should have said it at the start, is we're going to do a couple of polls. So you're going to see a couple of polls come up um, just for a very quick opinion back. So my question, uh, I believe the poll is going to pop up, and the question is really, you know, what do you use currently for your asset uh, asset inventory uh, and, you know, asset management? So bitte machen Sie alle mit. Einfach draufklicken, was Sie heute für Asset Management benutzen. Und äh, genau, da sind wir schon sehr gespannt auf das, äh, das Ergebnis. Es gibt noch äh, fünf Sekunden Zeit. Und hier sind wir. Cool, yeah. And that's <clears throat> so that's interesting, yeah, because a lot of uh, we talk to a lot of people where they where they where they pretty much use those combinations and I just have Excel hell, right? Because they're trying Franken Frankenstein a, a solution together, right? Um, so that's interesting. Um, I suppose from there, really, it's there's many questions. There's many questions we need to know about our assets, right? Depending on what type of asset it is and, and things like that. Um, however, when we think of an asset and a device um, for in our organization, there's effectively six there may be more, but we broke it down to six essential questions that you should be able to answer with ease and with speed, right? And this really is, is the asset known and managed, right? Do we know what this, this asset is? Should it be there? And is it managed with the correct management um, tools and security tools, right? Or is it unknown or unmanaged or anything in between, right? Simple question, should it be there? Um, where is Where is the asset? Like, where is this asset located? What does it have connections to? What's its blast radius? Things like this. So where is this asset and should it be there as well? What is this asset, right? What actually is the asset? Do we know what it is? Do we know what its capabilities are based on that? Um, and is this inherently bringing in any risk? Um, we think of core software on an asset, right? So the software that we expect to be there and we approve to be there, is that being maintained and updated? Right. A simple, basic question. Um, if it isn't, does is that introducing risk? And what's in place to make sure that that happens? Right. So these are the basic questions we have. And then, you know, is there additional software? Is there software that we don't know about that shouldn't be there? And does that bring in risk? Right. This always happens. Um, and I suppose lastly is, does this asset then adhere to my policies? You may be following a framework of sorts. You may be, you know, following your own in-house policy something you came up with, whatever it may be, does this asset adhere to it? And if it doesn't, what happens, 
right? And these are kind of things, no matter what that asset is, you should be able to, if someone asks that question, you have the answer straight away, right? Not requiring a lot of manual work to try and figure that out. And that's kind of where we're, where we're going at from here. So quite often to answer these questions and to kind of do asset management, uh, a lot of people had traditionally, and we saw with the poll, um, use CMDBs or they use their own sheets or, you know, they, they, as I say, Frankenstein, a solution together. Um, the talk track here, we're going to look at CMDBs specifically, right? Uh, just as an example, so you can understand where, where the gaps are when we talk about modern asset management. Um, and that's kind of where we're going with this. So to understand, we're going to start off with just very quickly on what is a, a CMDB for anyone who's not overly familiar with the workings, I suppose, of, of it. Um, and when we think of CMDBs, we're, we're traditionally looking at asset inventory for asset management, right? But it's not really the asset management tool that we're looking for, uh, you know, for a modern asset management approach, especially when we move into what we're calling this asset intelligence. You know, CMDBs were traditionally used for tracking very specific information, right? Things like, um, has the license changed for the operating systems or has there been a hardware change or something like that? Um, and because it has a lot of the information, it was kind of pushed into being used for asset management. But with today's cyber landscape, the modern landscape, we'll call it, things like cloud and IoT and all those modern, modern assets that we've already mentioned, it really spans much further beyond what a CMDB was traditionally supporting and what it supported traditionally, okay? Um, but that's kind of what is a, a CMDB. And then who uses CMDB? So there's a whole, I suppose, a lot of departments and a lot of personnel would use a CMDB for different reasons. You know, you think maybe there's a team that tracks servers and workstations across the enterprise. Um, you think of governance and risk and compliance teams working with those auditors, right? Uh, we mentioned frameworks, if you're following the, some of those for, for the audits and preparation. Finance is a good one. Like maybe you have finance teams who are keeping track of workstations because maybe they're migrating to MacBook or something and they need to know, they need to take some sort of account of how many they're going to have to move across and, and need to switch and what the impact of that is. Um, network infrastructure teams, right? So we've already spoke about the huge digital transformation over time and uh, over the years. They need to understand and keep track of what those different types of assets are. And that could be quite difficult. And they try to do that with CMDBs as well. But, you know, you think of IT architects, they're more around, you know, the, the who and what. So it's like, where is the stuff in the network and how many of each device do I have? Stuff like that. Security operations is, is, is a team, I suppose, we're very familiar with uh, and we work close with as well, which is, you know, their real job is ensuring everything is where it needs to be and that all the applications are working um, on those devices are working correctly, right? So you're, you're adhering to uh, the standards that you've set, right? So when we think of, you know, what is a CMDB and who uses a CMDB, we can really start to focus a little bit on some of the core problems when we think of asset management and kind of why CMDBs fail for security teams. Now, this is not a, it's not a session to diss CMDBs. It's just there's obvious gaps when we think of asset management where simply CMDBs cannot fulfill, right? So we're thinking of, of common challenges. And these are the conversations I'm having every day with people when they come to me with, with hey, you know, hey, David, we really need help to do X, Y, and Z. And this is kind of what we're going to just highlight here. So... Some of the core, uh, some of the core problems that we face um, with a CMDB is not complete data, right? And what I mean by not complete data in this instance is a CMDB is largely just a manual process of of populating it. Um, you know, whether it's populated by a scanner, populated manually from an Excel sheet. I know a lot of you are saying you use Excel um, for your asset management. And yes, we've already mentioned you can pull some stuff together. You know, if you had someone who's quite savvy at scripting or you hire in some third party and to do some, you know, as we call it, the, the Frankensteining something together, but it's never complete and never up to date. You don't have the complete picture of your entire landscape and all those modern um, asset types. Um, you know, we think of workstations, but also cloud native devices, mobile devices, IoT devices, you know, people have BYOD policies in place. It just makes things much more complex when you're trying to get the complete picture, okay? Um, so that's one area. Then another area is it's not fully contextual. Now, this is a big one, you know, for me, my opinion personally is I think context is so important. Um, 
a lot it's a lot of kind of good knowing what you know what a thing is but what does it mean what you know what's the impact that this has is there a risk um associated to it so when we talk about asset intelligence um and, and context what we're really talking about is the relationship from one device to another device or one device to its like you know um security appliance or management um device or something like that effectively asking what is the story of our environment right what does it mean Right. And if you if you know that, then you're able to answer more into, you know, more, I suppose, effectively, right? And make better decisions. Um, not unique, right? This is a huge thing when we think of CMDBs, right? Is quite often you could have, you know, a device changing IP addresses simply, right? Or take it in different data sets. And your device could exist, you know, two, four, ten times in your CMDB, right? And it's it becomes this real labored man hour to try and clean up your cmdb right and then it becomes very hard to accurately report on that data because can you trust it right and it's it's hard to check that box to say yes we're secure because yes you may have eliminated one line but there's another nine lines for that same device that are not crossed off so now your report is kind of you know tainted um if you will and it's not accurate and so not unique assets is a big thing with CMDBs. Not credible data, right? This is an interesting one where you could be take you could be talking about the same device or the same data point or field, but the values are very different, right? Depending on where that information is coming from. So you get um you don't get that fully, I suppose, comprehensive picture um about your the assets and and organ and uh, organization when you're looking at at the data in a CMDB sometimes um, for this as well. Not up to date, right? We already mentioned um, it's a largely manual process to populate CMDB, right? And yes, it would be great to have it all automated all of the time, um, but when it's not up to date, you can't really do much with the data, right? And when you think of cybersecurity, you need to know like who and what you are and you know, be able to answer those six essential questions that I spoke about um, to really be able to perform those advanced techniques an effective incident response and things like that. Um, and the last point I'll make here is say no ability, but really what we're talking about here is the ability to be able to, you know, uh, when you look at a CMDB, it's usually this, a snapshot in time, right? When it was last updated, that was it. But really what we want to be able to do is can we retrospectively go back and look at a, look at the state of play from a previous or past date? Right. Yes, today I can see we have you know x you know eighty percent coverage with our scanning tool or whatever. But where were we on the first of October this year when something went down? Can we see what the state of play was and what was failing and what was deviating from our policy and stuff on that day? And you just can't do that with a CMDB, right? When you're thinking about it from the security practitioner's mindset. Um. So why does it matter, right? So why does it matter really? What we're talking about here is. Everything we've just said, basic cyber hygiene, um, you know, basic security um, questions done well, done easily. Right? This, this is what we need as security practitioners. But also, when we think of compliance, right, you might be following a framework like NIST or CIS or whatever controls you're following, or maybe it's your own in-house policy. But most of these controls, controls one and two, are usually we need a full credible inventory of all your assets and devices and you know information of what's installed on those and what's running on those and you know really understanding and then trusting that data so it's a huge thing when we think of just your basic needs as a security practitioner but also from a compliance standpoint it's just something that's needed to be there and we need to be able to do it better right so this is where we're going to interject and do our second poll i believe um yes. about Yes, so it's a really about asking the question, where are you having your biggest challenges, I believe? So do you want to run that poll? So, so now, the next frage ich bitte wieder um rege Teilnahme. Vorher wurde angemerkt, das war ein bisschen zu schnell, deshalb würde ich jetzt bitten, dass Sie einfach nochmal sich die Frage in Ruhe durchlesen und ich schauen, dass sich, wie sich es entwickelt. Okay. Ich komme noch ein paar, noch ein paar Antworten. 
Okay. Letzte zehn Sekunden, dann beende ich das Ganze. Und der Winner ist. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, this is this is about this is about what I expected. I expected the visibility one to actually win, but it was interesting. Yeah, the, all all of the above equally is, a, is an interesting result too. Um, so yeah, this is consistent to what we're seeing across across the board. These are the the main challenges, and that visibility is a, is a big challenge, and, and in context as well. Cool. Um, yeah, good, interesting responses. Um, so we move on then to where. So we've we've discussed the challenge at asset management. We've discussed CMDBs and where they fail for security. Now we're going to move into kind of the solution and how we deal with that, right? So data source diversity, uh, you know, is critical to asset management and practitioners, right? And and really what we mean by that is, you know, if you work in security, you hear no a lot. Right? There's a lot, of, a lot of the word no going around, right? As in, no, you can't have access to this. No, you can't do that. No, it's not possible to merge that data. No, you can't normalize that and all this thing. And we really want to move to yeses and successes. And I know that's a bit wordy, but really that's what we're, what we, with asset intelligence, we want to give you the ability to answer those questions better and not hear no all the time, right? And to be able to build confidence and even complement things like CMDBs, make CMDBs more effective. And really that's that's what we're doing here, right? Truing up systems. So when we talk about that, we talk about CASM. Right? I know, uh, I think uh, Christoph had mentioned that at the start as well. And CASM was really introduced at this stage, um, you know, coined by Gartner, uh, you know, a Gartner term, but really what CASM is, is modern asset management, right? They call it cyber attack surface management. And the idea of chasm is to just simply frame the solution in a better way. And, you know, with asset management, there was an awful lack of accountability because if something went wrong, it was who, who, who's taken ownership of that, who owns that asset, who's responsible for this. With chasm, it becomes kind of an organizational problem to try and solve. And really, it's focused on asset visibility, right? So it was interesting, your poll, the winner was, we struggle with visibility, right, and inventory. When Chasm's sole real, you know, focus is gaining that visibility problem, and then understanding security gaps that come from that, right? So how do we, how do, how does Chasm, how is Chasm defined? And this is not an exonious term. This is, you know, industry term. And how to define Chasm? Well, it really is to show all your assets, both internally and externally, true API integrations with tools you're already using today. So, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But really, it's about connecting to these things in your environment that you have already because the data is already there so we don't need to double the work right um and from there then if we have if we're able to pull all the data from all of your tools we can consolidate that data and then be able to query and do gap analysis right so see everything make it <clears throat> all um you know consolidated and then do gap analysis from there and, and effectively close those gaps and help you improve your security posture. That's what Chasm is all about. What's driving the adoption of Chasm? Well, I've just broken this down into two main, two main departments, like from IT and from a security perspective. From IT, it's really around device discovery, you know, seeing everything, um, managing the endpoints, and then you know, managing the configuration of those endpoints to make sure they're effectively working. When we talk about security drivers, uh, we're really talking about incident responses and vulnerability management processes, all the way down to that, you know, governance and risk and how they work with the auditing team and prep for audits and things like that. Um, and that's what's kind of been driving the adoption of Chasm to date. So what I've already mentioned is the tools you're using today, they are what we would call collectors. They already house the data about the assets in your environment. Um, you know, different vantage points, as I call them. Um, so what we need to do is pull it all together in with an aggregator or a correlator, something that brings all that data together from all those different vantage points to be able to get the true story of your environment. Um, so this is where we introduce Exonius, right? So we've spoken about the challenge. We've talked about, you know, how to frame the solution with Chasm. Let me introduce it to Exonius. So Exonius and the approach that we take here is we have out of the box, I think it's 569 to date, um, 
data sources that we plug into. So this is everything from, you know, your network infrastructure layers, your endpoint management, your endpoint security, your protection, your scanning tools, your agents, your NACs, your PAMs, your certificate management. Every tool in your organization, we're, we're going to be pretty much able to connect to, right? And by being able to do that and pull in those data sources, we are going to empower, empower you to be able to do three things. And I call these the three big rocks, as, as how I refer to them all the time. Is rock one is we're going to build a credible, comprehensive inventory of all your devices and assets uh, and applications, things like that, right? So we have a, a table of truth. Um, from that table, we can then do gap analysis and discover the areas that you know you have most risk in or areas that are of most concern to you um, and do this in a meaningful way, regular way to make sure it's not just you know a lot of man hours to do very simple tasks. And then of course, if you find the gaps and you have that table of truth, we want to close the gaps and enforce some sort of a policy or an action um, to improve your posture, right? And that's kind of the approach uh, Exonius is taking on. Um, now, I spoke about asset intelligence, right? And, and the, move, the move to asset intelligence over asset management. And what does that mean? Well, to, just to put it simplistically, right? To, to work this out, just so it's not a term that you just hear me say from, from time to time. If we think about the primary focus of an asset management solution, it was really around showing me, you know, the device and the license life cycles. When we think about things from an asset intelligence point of view, it's really about showing me all of my assets, give me the context of those assets, what they mean in terms of the relationships, and then bring to the surface what we need to do most or what we need to do first, right? What is the most, where's the most risk? Where's the areas we need to, of concern? You know, when we think of traditionally as an asset management, what was the data source? CMDB you know, Excel sheets, whatever it might be, right? That was your main data source, right? You, you got it all, you made all your decisions based off one single source, which was your CMDB, right? But when we think of asset intelligence, we think of it being agnostic. Like, so we, we can literally connect to hundreds of sources and correlate the data together to come up with a true, um, the true story of your environment, right? Um, when we think of asset types, um, you know, traditionally it was for physical hardware with asset management and, and what it supported. But now with, with asset intelligence, we moved on to all those modern landscape that we spoke about, right? Users, applications, cloud instances, IoT devices, all of these new, uh, you know, containers, Lambda functions, all these new things um, that didn't exist 20 years ago. Um, the results quite often with asset management, you get, like we've already spoken about, conflicting data, you know, not credible data, outdated data, unusable data. But when we think of asset intelligence, we think of clear understanding of all of our assets, how they relate to our policies, and having custom responses to effectively reduce my risk when and where needed. Right. And when we think of the use cases um, for traditional asset management, it was really hardware and software inventory. But when we think of asset intelligence, we move really into this you know, device discovery, you know, truing up our CMDBs and reconciling that, you know, effective configurational management, uh, endpoint protection management, vulnerability management, incident response, all of these things we can now do with asset intelligence by simply pulling our data together and making things more streamlined. Okay. And I'll just kind of finish up with this, which is around the common use cases. So there are hundreds of use cases and every organization will have different use cases or, or at least a different take on the use case. But traditionally speaking, these types of use cases is what we'll go through in a demo as well in a moment. Um, really is looking at things like, you know, show me the managed devices versus unmanaged devices and, and where, where they are and what, what I need to do to reduce that risk. Is there devices, you know, missing their endpoint agents or something, some issue with the endpoints agents not functioning correctly? You know, can we reconcile the CMDB? Can we true up the data that the CMDB has so it becomes more credible and more reliable, right? Um, I suppose, is there devices that are not being scanned um, on my network and, and, and should they be? And if not, can we true up to make sure they're scanned the next time? Um, and then of course, prepping for audits and, and getting everything in line to reduce the hours uh, the hours and hours and hours that go into prepping for audits and things like that as well. Okay. Um, so I think our last poll is coming up yes. now. And I, 
Yeah, cool. Yeah. So absolutely, yes. So go for it. I started. Go for it. Yeah. So also here geht's jetzt drum um uh, was man oder was Sie oder Ihre Kunden als uh, einen der offensichtlichen Use Cases Anwendungen sehen. Auch hier bitte ich Sie um uh, rege Teilnahme. Uh, ich lasse wieder ein bisschen, ein bisschen mehr Zeit, dass man sich es nochmal durchliest. Was sind die offensichtlichen Use Cases? Was denken Sie, was könnte bei Ihnen oder Ihren Kunden am besten passen? Okay, die letzten zehn Sekunden. Wählen Sie jetzt. Okay, dann beende ich jetzt. Und der Winner ist. Ja, uh, yeah. all of the above. <laughs> that's, that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's interesting. I was expecting all of the above to win, all right. Um, which obviously covers the agent gaps and coverage gaps as well. Um, cool, perfect. Okay, so I think um, that's all for presentation. So really what we're going to do now is dive into a demo. Um, Maybe there are two questions we have already. Maybe, yeah. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, go, yeah, so go the, the first question was, uh, how is Axonius deployed? And, uh, yeah, so that, yeah, we haven't covered. Offer. Yeah, so we, ha we haven't covered, we haven't covered the deployment, but effectively the deployment of the Exonius platform, it's, it's agentless, it doesn't require scanners or anything like that. We've already said we plug into the tools that are there and we deploy it wherever suits you. So we can give it to you as a, as a, um, a virtual appliance to which you could install on your VMware's, Hyper-V's, wherever you do your, your, your virtual uh, images. Or we can offer it to you as a, a SaaS offering. So we host it with an AWS backend and um, you simply deploy a tunnel to connect to your on-premise um, tools as well. Okay. Okay, so you answered already the second questions. If there are agent, there's a third one. Is it SNMP based? Um, so yeah, so we don't we don't have um, we don't have agents or anything like that uh, to to um, you know we, we don't need to deploy that because we're pulling the information that already exists and we don't need to I suppose double 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 the work to pull the same information if it already exists. Okay, the other question was is it SNMP based? In terms it, like in terms of it collecting the data I assume, you know, with SNMP protocol. I, I assume, you know, I yeah. asked the question. Yeah, so what what no. we'll do is what we'll do is I'll walk through in the demo how and where and how and where we're collecting and pulling that data from. And um, it's all going to be done through, you know, API to collect those data. Um, that are coming through as well and in read-only permissions stuff like that but okay. what i'll do is i'll address that as we go through the demo okay 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 so then go on with your yeah. with, with your demo i would have said just no it's not as an mp based yeah. <laughs> you want to start it so long so, so long that david here the demo uh aufbaut oder darauf zugreift, wollte ich das schnell beantworten. Nein, es ist nicht SNMP-basiert. Es sind rein API-Kopplungen, die dazu führen, dass die Daten, die schon in den vom David angesprochenen Asset-Quellen drinnen sind, rausgeholt werden können mit Read-Only-Credentials und dann in der zentralen Datenbank, die wir gerade auf dem Bildschirm sehen, das Dashboard dazu oder die, die, die Administrationsoberfläche. Dort werden die Daten dann, die Kopien dieser Daten äh, tatsächlich hingebracht und dort wird dedupliziert, dort wird normalisiert und korreliert und dann kommt es eben zu der Magie, dass wir ein viel besseres Bild äh, über die Assets haben, als wenn man jede einzelne Quelle einzeln fragt. Klare Antwort, nicht SNMP passiert. Ich höre wieder das Sprechen auf, David, your turn again. Cool, perfect. So uh, this is the platform. Um, and what I'm going to do is I call this uh, my James Bond approach, right? <laughs> just to entertain myself more than anyone. Um, but really, I just want to kind of show you a, a snapshot of, of how quick this tool can work. And then what I'll do is I'll build the story up again um, as we go through and, and it'll make more sense. So we're going to start off into the devices section. And what you're looking at on the screen, every line item here represents 
one single unique device in your organization. That's all you need to know for now. We're going to build this up as we go through. And you can see there's, you know, nearly four and a half thousand devices in this, you know, this environment. We can then use our query wizard to ask questions um, of our device sets and our, and our organization. So you remember when we started the, um, the presentation, I done a I done the question on a CISO walks into a room and he asks, uh, how many Windows devices do we have? Okay, and out of nine and a half thousand, I can ask that same question here in Exonius and say, show me all the devices that have an operating system type equal to Windows. And I can see we have 672 devices in our organization that are Windows, okay? Now, the next obvious question is, well, why, why is this any more accurate than anything else, right? And this is where we're going to build this up, okay? So where we do that is through the adapters. Now, you can see we have 569 adapters today, and the adapters are really going to range across multiple categories, right? So everything from attack surface management, cloud infrastructure, cloud management, you know, CMDBs, uh, you know, everything you can think of, EDRs, firewalls, scanners, NACs, PAMs, everything that's going to be there. So, you know, if you were a Cisco house um, for your networking, or if you were a Juniper house, something like that for your networking equipment, or of course, you may have be a Microsoft house for um, Active Directory, Azure, SCCM, you know, Intune, all this type of thing. We have all these adapters ready to go, you know, out of the box today. You know, maybe you're using CrowdStrike for your endpoint protection, or you're using, you know, Carbon Black or Sentinel One or something like that for your endpoint protection. Um, you know, what else is there? I suppose you know, maybe your scanning tools. You're using Tenable or Qualys or whatever it is. The point being here of showing you some of these is just to illustrate that this is pretty much ready to go for most of your tools today, right? I would say all of the tools. If there's a situation where I know a lot of you in the poll said you're using Excel files today. That's no problem. What we can actually do is ingest in CSV, right? You may need to change the column headers if they're not all, you know, if it's called host name. It can't be just called a random name, but as long as the naming convention suits or we can edit before we import it. But basically we can import that data if you already have it in some sort of a, just an Excel sheet somewhere. Or if you're using a custom tool, you know, that can export in JSON, or, you know, maybe it's got an SQL backend, something like that. The point being here that we can ingest pretty much any data you have on your assets through the tools you already have or through the custom tools you have or through whatever other format of data you have into this tool so we can normalize it and use it to enrich our, 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 our devices. And what we really do then is we simply just connect to these tools. I'm just going to pick one here. We connect to these tools that have you know APIs through API keys and they're read-only uh, access, so your API access key, secret key, your username, password, whatever you're using, um, to connect into those tools. And these adapters are by default, they pull once every 12 hours, but that is just the default setting. You can completely configure that to whatever. Maybe you want to pull it every one hour, maybe you want to pull it once a day, once a week, whatever it might be um, to that tool, but you can configure that as you, as you plug into these uh, adapters. Now, once you have all your adapters plugged in, you I'm looking at the device discovery section here. You can see here now the icons. You can pretty much work out the icons represent the, the adapter, right? So a Tanium adapter, AWS, BitSight, ServiceNow, FortiGit, things like that. And you can see the number here represents the number of devices that you're pulling in via that adapter. So, you know, three and a half thousand from Tanium, you know, 2,600 from AWS, 1,700 from BitSight, things like that. And really, once we pull in all the devices, we get what's called a total devices seen number here, right? However, if you think of your laptop, your laptop may exist in your network and your 40, 40 net knows about it. It may have a record in service now. Um, it maybe gets scanned by Tenable. Maybe it has a Tanium agent on it. Um, and multi, a multitude of things. So my point being one asset, one device can exist in multiple places, but it's only one device, right? So what we do is we correlate that data down and we say, here's not, here's not seven devices across seven tools. It's one device in seven places. So let's create a master record for that device and put an entire body of information along with that device that we now know about. So what we do is we put it through our correlation tool and we correlate that down to get a number of total unique devices.
okay? Now, these numbers are, you know, far too close for reality. It's just my lab environment. But in reality, you could have like a total devices seen count here of like 100,000 and only have 7,000 unique devices just because they're living across multiple multiple um, adapters and multiple data sources, okay? So we correlate that down to get that true unique number of devices that you have in your organization. And that is that first rock that we spoke about, a full, credible, comprehensive inventory of all your devices and assets, all right? Moving on to that second rock we talk about, and I'm going back to this page I started on now, these devices, now I would say, I would give a guess that when you're looking at this page the second time, you could pretty much guess what you're looking at. If this is a unique device, these are pretty much some of the data sources you're pulling information about this device from and where, where it lives, basically. Okay. And let me drill into one of these here before I go into gap analysis. Let me just check time. Okay, we got some time. So basically what we're saying is we can pull common fields, which are things like asset name, host name, IP addresses, MAC addresses, but also we can pull specific fields. And when we think of something like AWS, the level of detail here is phenomenal, like availability zones, resource uh, names, ARNs, um, you know, what security groups is this device in? Um, what policies is attached to this device? What firewall policies are attached to this device? What are the actions that are attached to this device? Um, EBS storage volume data, VPC information data. The point being here is you can query everything. So you can ask questions of the detailed specific data or the common fields data. When we aggregate all of our information together, these common fields that, that I've just shown, we can start to build up a picture of our device. So I can say that this single device has actually three different names across my network, depending on what tool you ask. Uh, it's got multiple host names. Maybe it's got multiple operating system strings. And then with the correlation engine, we, we have a kind of a trust model where we basically say, if the data comes from one source, it's more trusted than another source. And we work out that preferred truth. Uh, so we get this, what we call this preferred value, which is what we believe to be, you know, the most trusted source of value. Like you compare, if you ran a, a, a network scan with an on-credential scan, it's kind of guessing what things are. But if you have an endpoint agent installed, on it, it's going to know what it is. And if the two of those report on a device, we're going to know what the truth is, you know, know which one to trust more. And that's kind of how the trust model works. But that brings us back to the device section. I want to just go through a couple of scenarios here, right? So we, we asked how many Windows devices are in our organization. Maybe we want to say, hey, show me all of the Windows devices that were last seen in the last 30 days, right? So we're calling these like my active Windows systems. And I want to discover some sort of gap. So let's say my endpoint agent for this is CrowdStrike. So I'm saying, show me all of the active Windows devices, my organizational policy in this you know, environment. Let's say every Windows device should have a CrowdStrike agent on it. Say that's my policy. So I'm saying, show me all of the devices that have CrowdStrike on it, right? Now, I'm not breaking new ground here. I could simply go to the CrowdStrike management tool and look up this, not hard. But the fact that we're connected of multiple layers, the network layer, scanning layer, endpoint layer, et cetera, we can say, show me all the active Windows devices that do not have CrowdStrike on it, that should have CrowdStrike on it, right? And you can see how easy this is to just, you know, click through and create a query using the AND and OR technology. And we can layer this up. So here's 93 devices that should have an agent on it that do not have an agent on it, right? I could ask simply as well, show me the ones that were not scanned. Show me all the devices that don't exist in my CMDB, things like this. But for now, let's just pick this. We have a security gap. We have some gap analysis. I like this. I want to save it off as, you know, uh, DB, call it active win, win devices without CrowdStrike, something like that, right? And we save off the query. Now, of course, I can come in and I can load my saved queries that I have to view this data and things like that. But really what we want to do is that third rock. So the first one we've done, the device discovery, comprehensive, credible inventory. The second one is gap analysis. Here's a basic gap. We, we've analyzed and we want to do something about it, which is the third rock. We want to enforce some sort of an action plan. And this is where we use our enforcement center. So our enforcement center is the third piece of the puzzle, right, where we go and we need two things for an enforcement. 
One is a trigger and one is an action. So for the trigger, we're simply going to use um, the query we just built, active Windows devices without CrowdStrike agents, right? And I'm going to say, I want you to trigger to ask that query regularly, maybe once every number of hours or once a day or once a week or once a month or whatever, whatever suits your organization. So every Friday, I want to go see which devices have been missing the agent for the last seven days, something like that, right? And I want to do this every week. And I don't want to have to check. I just want to create some sort of an automatic plan. So I'm going to ask that question, you know, once a week. And if I find something, I want to do something about it, success action. So maybe I want to do something as simple as notify someone, send someone an email or a Slack message, whatever you're using, excuse me. Um, or perhaps you maybe want to link in with a ticketing system that you're using, right? Your Jira's, your Fresh Service, Zendesk, whatever you might be using to create an incident or a ticket to follow the workflows that you already have in place, right? We're just going to make that automatic so it just happens without someone having to do an investigation. Um, vulnerability assessment coverage. Hey, show me all the devices in business unit one that have not been scanned in the last week or in my cloud environment that haven't been scanned or something like that. Sure, you found some. I want to add these IPs um, or add these IPs to the next scan that you're going to run. Something like that. Right. Um, we spoke about CMDBs a lot today. Right. And I particularly like this one, the manage CMDB assets piece. So let's say you're using something like a service now. Right? And you could say, hey, show me all of the devices in my organization that do not have a record in my CMDB. Oh, you found some? Why don't you go and create those assets in my CMDB so we can populate it? Simple, right? Or maybe you want to do something like update your assets. So we talked about data not being credible, not being usable. So how about we go think of something like that operating system um, field that we mentioned, right? You're doing some discovery scanning and the operating system is not uh, not very confident that it's correct. However, we're pulling that from other sources. So why don't we do it on a regular basis? Every week, I want to uh, I want to grab all the accurate data and I want to get these fields in service now, whatever they might be, so, you know, operating system or whatever, and update them with the accurate fields from Exonius. So what we're going to do every week is true up our CMDB. And it doesn't require that manual process of having to do this yourself or validate it. We're going to validate it and do it automatically for you. Okay. And that's, um, I suppose that's kind of all I want to kind of go through. There's, there's many, many use cases. Uh, the, the dashboarding and reporting, I'll just finish up on this, is really around, um, you know, like any tool, we're going to have a way to illustrate and, and, and showcase the findings you do. Um, the the queries I ran for missing CrowdStrike agents, all of the modules in the dashboards are built off those queries as well. So we ask the questions, we save those, we use those in a search and our actions plan. And we also use these for reporting and dashboarding. So I can see I've done a dashboard here to show me missing CrowdStrike agents or malfunctioning agents and things like this. And I can see I get some sort of an illustration. But if I drill into this, it will bring me back to my devices page and I'll be able to see what that query was and have it all there ready to go if I want to get the data underneath that visualization. So that's kind of it for me in terms of the demo. And I know we're coming up on time. So if anyone has any questions or anything, um, or. OK. Uh, yeah. I'll turn my video on just. Uh, OK, so th thank you a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, David. Uh, actually, I have uh, two, two, two questions at the moment. Mm -hmm. The first question is, uh, how is the data stored? Where, where do you store this data? Yeah, so the data is stored on a, uh, the, uh, the backend DB is a MongoDB, um, and it's stored in a snapshot format as well. So you remember I spoke about one of the challenges at CMDB is the ability lo to look back in time. Well, we can see here, for example, I'm looking for missing CrowdStrike agents on active Windows machines today, but I can actually go back and pick a date in the past and want to know what was the state of play on the 23rd of November, for example. And this tool will go back and say, hey, there were 75 missing agents on the 23rd of November. So it's stored in a daily snapshot on a MongoDB backend um, for, the, for, the, for the virtual appliance as well. Uh, okay. And the next question is, uh, is there a list of adapters which are available for Axonius? Yes, so what we have is our documentation is pretty good 
um, in terms of you have some, you know, we spoke with use cases. So we documented some of the use cases and how to get those. Your question around adopters is if we click on adopters, we have like the A to Z list of adopters we have here. So it's a nice place to go check it out. If you don't like the best place to look would obviously be in the tool itself if you had the tool. But if you're just doing investigating, we do have it on the docs page. Um, you know, let's say it was census or something like that. You can go in and see what the parameters are uh, that, that, that's required for the adopter. It will give you a screenshot on what it looks like in our, in, our, in our tool when you're putting in those details, tell you what permissions you need, and also even shows you where to go in that tool to find those credentials that you need as well. So the documents is a good place to uh, put to search. But of course, if you have any questions, you can come straight to us as well. Okay, and uh, I may add, even if there would be no adapter, it's uh, quite easy to get the new adapter for, for a new whatever yeah. software platform if it's not available so far. Yeah, it's it's a big it's a big point for us. So our adopters are driven. So you see, we have five six five hundred and sixty nine adopters, and they are driven by the customer. So a customer comes to us and said, "Hey, I'm using this tool, and I need an adapter." And we can usually spend it up between one to four weeks. So usually we do it during a POC process, or we do it during you know uh, some sort of um, you know period of time. But usually about two two three weeks, we have have it spun up and done. It's one of the major uh, pluses with our software oh. engineers. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we are we are done. Cool. Um, thanks a lot, David. Thanks a lot, Christoph. Und natürlich vielen Dank an alle Zuhörer, dass Sie mit uns durchgehalten haben bei dem traurigen November, na Dezemberwetter. Entschuldigung, schon Dezember. Die Zeit vergeht. Und ich wünsche alle noch einen schönen Abend. Vielen Dank und tschüss. Thank you and bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.